next cycle, because of the massive money that it's going to take to pull us out of this downward spiral, you will jumpstart an inflation cycle, probably with a couple year lag, that will be, uh, I, am, I am calling for, and I think I'm unique in this, certainly was first if anybody's copying it now, but I'm calling for a complete retrace of the last 40 years of disinflation slash deflation if we get that next year. Um, so that we'll be back to 20% inflation rates by the end of the decade, 15% long bond, 15% 10 year. Thanks for joining us for part two of our interview with macro analyst, David Hunter. If you haven't yet watched part one of our discussion with David, in which he explains why he predicts investors will be taken by surprise First, by a 20% melt up in the markets from here, followed swiftly by a massive crash of up to 80%. Head over to our channel at youtube.com slash Wealthion and watch it there first. It sets the context for the investment perspective that David and our partners at New Harbor Financial share in this video. And don't forget to support this channel by first liking this video and then clicking the red subscribe button below as well as that little bell icon right next to it. If everyone watching right now takes those two simple steps, it really does help this channel reach a lot more people. Okay, let's get started watching part two of our interview with David Hunter. All right. Um, wow, David, uh, you, you don't miss words. You don't pull your punches. And uh, when you go big, you go big. Uh, largest global financial crisis in history. Um, you, you know, you see in the 10 year go from your prediction of two and a half to zero, um, 30 year going from 3% to half a percent or, you know, close to zero. Uh, those are huge moves dollar from 80 up to perhaps as high as 140. Um, and uh, well, look, uh, you, you're not alone in thinking that and, and really what you're describing uh, in terms of uh, the strengthening of the treasury market and the dollar in this type of kind of global contagion uh, is very similar to Brent Johnson's uh, dollar milkshake theory, which folks, if you want to get a deep dive into that, I interviewed Brent about a month ago. You can find that on the channel too. Um, David, you, you do seem uh, similar to many of the other guest experts that I've um, uh, interviewed here who all believe that there is um, uncomfortable probability of, of some sort of painful correction coming. Uh, you probably predict the deepest correction out of all of them, uh, but then to be followed by uh, central bank uh, inflationary policy, the likes of which that we just haven't even begun to see yet. Um, and it sounds like you just did a great job of, of, of describing that. So um, uh, let's then now move towards the crunch. The central banks then just completely go hog wild. Um, with trying to restoke inflation because we've just had this massive deflationary crunch. Um, uh, let's talk about that era. Um, are there particular sectors, asset classes, et cetera, that you would want to be positioned in for that, you know, tsunami of liquidity? Yeah, I, um, I would say this, this is where 48 years of doing cycles and, you know, I was, I was running pension money for the first half of my career. So, um, you know, paid a lot of attention to where we were in cycles, et cetera. This is where that pays off is I learned long ago through observation that every cycle has different leadership. So the leadership of this cycle, you could say is, you know, certainly the fangs and technology in general, um, and healthcare, those would be probably social media. Those would be the top of the leadership this cycle. Um, and next cycle, that stuff will be really weighed down a lot because they'll be working. Look how heavily overowned they are right now, right? Particularly the FANGs, for example. Those will be weighed down by um, you know distribution cycles as every time they lift their head out of that bear market and and move up, there's going to be, um, you know, more investors who say, oh, I finally got back to my cost. I'm getting out. And so they will spend the entire next cycle working through distribution. That's what happened. Look at, look at 2000. Look, it took, you know, took what, um, 10 or 15 years for a lot of those stocks that did so well in 2000 
you know, to get back and become viable stocks again. They were under distribution pressure for you know well over a decade. This will be the same kind of story um, in a lot of the groups that have done so well this cycle. Next cycle, because of the massive money that it's going to take to pull us out of this downward spiral, you will jumpstart an inflation cycle, probably with a couple year lag, that will be, uh, I, am, I am calling for, and I think I'm unique in this, certainly was first if anybody's copying it now, but I'm calling for a complete retrace of the last 40 years of disinflation slash deflation if we get that next year. Um, so that we'll be back to 20% inflation rates by the end of the decade, 15% long bond, 15% 10 year. And I'm not sure whether we make new highs or whether they just go back to those highs, but that's a, that's a huge move to come out of, wow. you know, negative to zero rates and come out of negative to zero inflation. And in less than 10 years, be it, you know, back where we were in the early eighties. Um, so what that means is you have interest rates trending upward and ultimately trending sharply upward through the decade, through the balance of the decade. That puts a real um, top on or, or a, a um, halter on um, the PE multiples of stocks, right? You're going to go in reverse. We went from Part of, part of the big part of biggest part of the bull market we've had since 1982, and I call this a secular 39 year secular bull market that started in August of 1982. The biggest thing that has moved us tremendously, many, many, many times where we were then, is the fact that we went from single digit PE multiples to 25 times. Um, we're going to do the entire reverse of that and go from, you know, if interest rates go from zero to 15% and short rates probably go from negative to 20% plus, you're, you're going to see PE multiples go back from 25, they'll, they'll go down a lot in the bust, uh, but then, uh, I mean, market's gonna go down a lot, multiples, your earnings are gonna be zero or negative, um, but, but multiples over the next cycle will, will go in reverse and, and head back towards whether they get the single digit or not, they'll be heading back in that direction. So that means, you know, what are you not betting on? You're not betting on lower interest rates and expanding PE multiples. You're betting, the only thing you can bet on is those industries that will benefit from inflation and produce earnings that can outstrip inflation. The biggest sector that can do that is commodities. You know, some some industrial companies, you know, the caterpillars of the world that feed into the mines, et cetera, they'll do very well. Their earnings will outstrip inflation, but the ones that will outstrip the most will be will be inflation cycle. I mean, uh, commodity commodity stocks. So that's that's basically energies included. You know, fossil fuels will be back in favor in a big way, and I'm not not like what we've had here in the last month. Fossil fuels will, I fully expect oil to go to $300 plus before the end of the decade, um, probably $400 plus. I fully expect you know gold to go 10,000 plus, could be 20,000 plus. You know, silver 300 plus could be 500 plus. So, so there are big moves coming. Copper will be up many times what it gets to this cycle you know, the commodities are gonna be printing money. Um, the problem is commodity cycles are very short because we can't handle that inflation for very long. Um, we're already gonna be looking at a consumer that's pretty, you know, is trying to dig out from the horrendous bust that they went through. Um, but you know, it's gonna be a very different cycle. That's why I, I cautioned before, I'm not talking about something that's very pretty. I'm just saying there's there is one more recovery cycle where if you're in the right places you can you can um, you know do well, um, but it's going to be what I would compare it to is the um, cycle from the mid '70s to the early '80s, you know where we saw we saw capital expansion, plants were being built, you know heavy equipment plants were being built, capacity was building up. We got supply chain issues where we're going to bring 
We're going to be reshoring a lot of capacity. Um, you know, semiconductor plants are going to be built, et cetera. That's where you're going to see the activity. It's not going to be what we've had for the last four decades, which is a consumer driven cycle. You know, you're not going to be um, betting on retail or um, consumers in general. You know, it's not going to be housing. It's not going to be, uh, there'll, there'll be components of autos for sure. You know, EV is going to be pushed hard. Um, but I, I do think, as I say, the difference between myself and some of the real gloom and doomers that can only see downside from here is I, I say we, we do have one cycle left. And then I'm probably the biggest gloom and doomer ever because what I just described leads to something very horrific in the 2030s. You can't, you can't drive interest rates up to 15% and have the debt levels we have and solve that equation. I don't, I don't see any solution other than massive default across the globe. I mean, basically it's the end of the Ponzi scheme. Okay. All right. I'm going to try to get everybody to pull their heads out of the oven here, David, but no, this is great. I really appreciate um, really the, the exceptional detail that you're going into with your forecast here. Um, I really also am glad that you, you sort of clarified um, that, you know, you, you don't see the emergence out of the bear market um, as a sort of return to a sustainable form of prosperity. It's more sort of, of a, as you said, a recovery phase. Uh, but one that eventually gets dragged down by um, the high interest rates that we have here uh, that just collapses the whole global debt Ponzi that, that you just mentioned. Um, yeah, I, I'd I, like, if, if I could, Adam, I'd, I'd like to just mention one piece of that that's important for investors, and that is that um, I, I think the highs we make in the stock market this cycle, so whether that's 5,300 on the S&P, you know, 18,000 on NASDAQ, whatever it is, the highs we make this cycle, I think will stand for decades to come. And, and because of what I think happens in the 2030s and beyond, I can almost say forever, but you, know, you can't say forever in this business. So, but the highs will not be even approached in the next cycle. So that doesn't mean, you know, commodity stocks will make, you know, many probably go beyond this cycle's highs by many fold, but in, in the overall market, the indexes, you will not get your money back if you if you're in an index fund at the end of this cycle, and you and you believe the buy and hold mantra that's been around since the 1980s. Uh, you know that's when it really became kind of the mantra of the financial industry. Um, you you probably will never get back to the level you'll be at at the end of this cycle. So. Um, you know, people have to understand it. it requires a different mindset. Active management will be a much more favorable um, industry or approach going forward. You know, this idea that we can buy index funds because they, out, they outperform most active managers because of that whole PE multiple interest rate story. You know, think about that going forward. You got the reverse of that. You've got the indexes having a hard time keeping up with active managers because PE multiples are shrinking. All right, well, thanks, David. I think that's a very, very important point to reinforce. And for folks that don't really are having trouble imagining that happening, uh, there's precedent. You just look at Japan, right? You know, we're, we're still substantially below the highs that the Japanese stock market hit in, uh, in the 80s. So uh, it, 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 it certainly can happen. And I see you nodding as I'm saying this, David. Um, David, that's a great segue for me um, in, in just a moment to talk to the, the guys at New Harbor, uh, who I do every week. They're going to send you uh, your commission check in the mail for making that plug for active management. Um, but I completely <laughs> agree with the rationale for, for why. Um, just very quickly, David, um, I, I do actually want to dig with you deeply at some point into your forecast for the 2030s. Um, I've taken up way too much of your time right now, um, but uh, hopefully that can be the topic of another uh, another video that we do here. And, and really, no matter what happens from here, um, I'm going to want to have you back on to, to give us your color commentary as where we are here in the story. Uh, very quickly, because uh, it's unfair for me to ask this question, but I know I'm going to get slammed either way for, for ask, not, either not asking it or leaving too little time like I'm going to right now. But what is your just top level opinion on cryptocurrencies? Yeah, I, 
I first of all, I say at the outset that I don't follow it. So, you know, my opinion is not something anybody should pay much attention to with it. I, I tend to feel that it needs to get through the um, bust to be tested through the bust to see what it really does represent. I'm skeptical of it, honestly. Um, I think it's grown out of a a true dislike of central bank policy for good reason. I mean, we, you know, a lot of what we're describing about what, what we're going to be seeing going forward can be laid on on the central bank. So there's this real hatred out there for you know the the um, policies that we've seen over many decades in terms of printing money and allowing us to get this point. As I say, you know, the Fed and other central bankers. Uh, should not be absolved from it, but they also aren't the only culprit. The you know the politicians and even ourselves, we all kind of are guilty of being a piece of it. So, so crypto, I think, has kind of grown out of that hatred for um, central planning, central bank policy, and liking the idea that you can have something outside a controlled system where you know where there's limited. You you can't just increase the supply willy nilly. Um, so. I, I get it, but I, I do think it's a very untested thing. And, and part of the dynamics of crypto that bothers me is that it right now it's taking on a lot of the aspects of any momentum stock or you know what we've seen recently in oil. It gets a frenzy simply because the tape's going up. You know, so in other words, investor psychology is playing a big role. And yet you have a lot of crypto analysts pretending that that's not the case, that it's all about fundamentals. And so, so those are the kind of the red flags that stand out to me in terms of saying, well, let's let's just see how it how it comes through the crisis. On the other side of the crisis, I may feel very differently. But um, you know, uh, there's going to be a lot of things that I don't think survive the bust. All right. Well, fine answer in such a short period of time I gave you, and I'm so sorry to have done that, but thank you. And uh, well, David, look as we wrap up here. Um, for folks that have very much enjoyed this discussion, crawling inside your brain, seeing what you see through your eyes, if they'd like to follow you and your work, what's the best way they can do that? Sure, yeah, I'm on Twitter every day, so they can find me there at Dave H. Contrarian. Um, and I also um, write a investment letter that comes out quarterly. My most recent one just came out. Um, and that is by subscription, it's for a cost, but if they are interested in, in finding out more about that, they can um, come on Twitter, just direct message me from there and I'll, I'll get right back to them with the details. Great, all right, and when we edit this video, I'll put up the URL for your Twitter handle there so it'll be really clear where folks Great. should go. Well, David, as I said, first off, thank you so much for giving us so much time and so much detail. Um, we'll continue following you regularly as we do. We mention you in this program almost every other week, practically just tracking your, your forecasts. Um, but uh, no matter what happens from here, like I said, um, we're going to want to have you come on either as your forecasts prove to be you know, con continued uh, on the mark or if things start deviating, we'll have you back on to give us your latest thoughts on that. Um, but uh, thank you so much and um, look forward to having you back on the program soon. Thanks, Adam. Take care. You too. All right. Well, John and Mike. Uh, so folks, this is the time on the program where I talk with the lead partners at New Harbor Financial, the financial advisory firm officially endorsed by Wealthion. Um, uh, we're going to talk about what the markets have done over the past week. But John and Mike, uh, Let's start with you, John. Reaction to what we just heard there from David. Yeah, well, uh, first want to say, um, you know, David is someone who has certainly earned his chops and his stripes in, in financial markets. Uh, you know, I think you might have mentioned, and we should remind folks, he's, he's been in markets for over 50 years, I believe. There aren't too many folks who have seen all the things he's seen. So he certainly comes with a depth of experience and perspective and, you know, even the, you know, tools to really understand the, the sentiment and psychology, which he he focuses so much on in his cyclical analysis. So, um, yeah, we, we could certainly, um, you know, find some counterpoints to some of the short-term sentiment things that he points to, but we are absolutely, I think, in broad alignment and agreement with his big picture um, calls in, in terms of the cycles of things. And I would, I would say to folks that uh, as um, 
contrary and bullish as his near-term view might be compared to most people's, um, I think that really is a, a, a side distraction to the bigger message of his comments there. I mean, he used terms like the, the biggest financial crisis the world has ever seen in, 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 in history. Um, you know, to put some numbers, you know, let, let's let's take his his near term forecast for the S and P, for example. Um, you know, if if it were to go to 5,300, like he now projects as a target, that's about a 23 percent up move from from today. Now, that's very very compelling to someone, right? Hey, 23 um, percent with conviction. Yeah, let, why not? Let's go for that, right? But he also calls for an 80 percent decline. And if you do the round trip there, even if you were to capture that 23 percent upside. The round trip is still a, almost 76% loss. So um, it's really important for folks to, I, I think the, the the key value in his his call there, and he he himself said he's not a market timer. So I think for folks that are are like th that we work with that are are thinking about their their retirement security, their financial security, the, the, the only chance they've ever had to build a nest egg and won't get another chance. Um, I would use his his near term forecast, and we we were the first to say that as as much as we're convinced this market's going to likely take the path of a major bust like he projects, you know we have no clue how high it could go in the near term. It's every bit higher, I think, is just more ammunition for for the decline that he and we think is coming. Um, but I think the key takeaway for for investors or clients that we work with and, and folks that are thinking about their own monies is to use his near-term forecast as, you know, kind of uh, an awareness that it's going to get, it can, it can get crazy. It can get crazy in a seductive kind of way. And I would almost view it as, you know, don't let the siren song suck you in um, with a crazy upside scenario, because the ultimate path is likely you're going to get that blown away, if, even if you were to capture that and, and, you know, end up a big loser, right? That, that's the key message I would like to, to highlight. Great. Yeah. And, and I think David really goes out of his way if you follow uh, his commentary online to let people know that, um, uh, you know, he is sort of a trend forecaster, but not a market timer, as you said earlier on. And uh, at any point in the near term, the market's really in control. And so um, it, it, it's sort of a, a way of saying it's going to be extremely hard for somebody to kind of um, accurately time all the trends that he's predicting. So I think he would say have a pretty big error factor in there. And as he talked about active management, you know, if you are going long this period before such a massive crash, boy, you want to be doing so um, both with the help of somebody who is watching the markets very closely like a hawk all the time, but also putting hedges in place so that if you know the timing uh, surprises you, uh, you're not riding the full 80% down you know, in, in the way that you were just describing there, John. So, um, all right, um, Mike, uh, love to hear any reaction you have. Uh, and, and then um, also, if I can just ask you to sort of comment on, uh, you know, sort of generally what we've seen over the market over the past week, it seems like it's, it's largely been um, very volatile, like I said in my intro, but, uh, but, but things are still sort of drifting down. I think today we're still seeing uh, yet another down day across almost every asset class here. So um, let's get your reaction first and then any commentary you have on the, the recent market action. Yeah, I, I found David's uh, talk fascinating. Uh, John covered most of, of, of what I thought was relevant in his talk. Now, I, I find it fascinating that um, David calls eventually after a drop in the dollar index from its present 93 or 94 down to 80, uh, for a big move up to about 140, that's a massive move in the dollar. And uh, it is extremely challenging to try to catch the tail end of this, this bubble. We may have already seen it, it's possible. Or maybe we do have another 20% upside, I don't know. But I don't think many people are going to be able to time that very well. And, and we think that most people should reduce exposure to stocks substantially and sit on a large amount of cash. Even if short term, there's a little bit of downside in, in that cash, you know, a move from 90 to 80 or so um, is not a small move, but compared to the ultimate move much higher, um, it's, 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 not, it's, it's not really very painful. Plus, more importantly, cash will allow you to buy assets cheaper than what's likely to be a deflationary bust over the next couple of years, either stock market assets or real estate assets. So I just wanted to mention that. And a few things about the market. 
We watched the market very closely. The market really seemed to be trying to top out going back to at least May. It's a big rolling top, a broadening top with different indices topping at different times. Just taking a look at some of my notes. Um, the utilities so far are leading the way down from the September high. The utilities index is down about 10%, and the S&P itself is down about 5%. But you know, digging into some of the indexes in particular, the transports, topped on May 10th. Um, the Dow topped on May 10th and then had a higher high in, in early September, mid-September. It broke through to a new high only for five or six days, kind of poked out and then rolled over again. Uh, and, and the whole time through this, breath was bad. It's really just a handful of stocks driving this market up. And if you look right now at the market, the S&P or the, or the Dow, um, we're, we're trading back at those levels that we were trading at in May. So here we are five months later and, and almost everyone feels like this market is going up and it has gone up over the last bunch of years, no doubt about that, but really it hasn't gone anywhere in the last five months or so and warning signs abound everywhere and different markets or indices are topping out at different times. This is classic late stage behavior in a, in a, in a bull market. And it's topping behavior, frankly. Now we don't know. Maybe we do get one last uh, gas higher. But if, if nothing else, we have learned humility in these last few years. But I don't think it's worth it to try to hang in there and try to get a squeeze a little bit more. As John said, you know, an eighty percent decline from a higher level of fifty three hundred, you know, turns into like a seventy six percent decline. Even if you catch the tail end of this, there's just no way to to have your cake and eat it too. So again, we would we would be taking the warning signs that we're seeing in this market seriously and use any strength to, to lighten up. If you're overexposed, just lighten up right now. Don't wait for a bounce back up to the high because there's no guarantee that it will happen. One last thing, we're seeing a, a, even just over the last week, kind of some crazy action in the market. The S&Ps trading in basically a 100 point range between 4280 and 4380 has literally been ping ponging back and forth for five days. It, it doesn't mean that much in itself, although it does seem like there's a difference in behavior and characteristic in this market. And, and for a market that's down 5% from a tie with all kinds of warning signs, um, having this ping pong action is, is it, it's, a, it, it's troubling. And I think that people should heed the warning and, and take some defensive action. Thanks, Mike. Well said. Yeah, and that, that ping pong you're talking about, um, a lot of people liken that to the, the turbulence that you you know sort of feel in the aircraft before it starts plummeting down. To, to use a really scary analogy, um, is, is you know is that what we're seeing here? Well, time will tell. But it's the kind of uh, signs that you would expect to see sort of before a big uh, air pocket, pocket drop in the markets. Um, well, look, I just wanna zoom back up to the high level just for a moment. Um, so, uh, you know, Mike, you just reiterated all the reasons uh, to be very skeptical of uh, how much longer today's, uh, uh, you know, the, the, or skeptical of today's market prices and the fact that uh, the uh, upward trajectory that we've enjoyed for the past year and a half may indeed be ending maybe even now. Um, whether you're, you're right, whether David's right, and we have one last gasp higher. And, and you know, in his mind, he's talking about the next quarter or two. I mean, it's still in the big picture scheme of things, still a relatively you know, near-term uh, outlook uh, to then be followed by some large correction. Um, again, David's is, prediction is huge, 80, up to 80%. Um, we've had other experts on that predict anywhere from 20 to 30 to 50, et cetera, but it's gonna be likely to be substantially large. Um, uh, the point I'm trying to make here is, is uh, you, you don't want to be overextending uh, yourself uh, when the risk of a correction is that near term. And we just put out a video uh, two weeks ago, guys, a video on how to hedge against a market correction that we've gotten a lot of great positive feedback on. Uh, the point I'm trying to underscore here is this really is the time to start hedging against the correction, whether it happens in a quarter or two, the way that David is saying, or whether it comes a lot sooner, um, as you guys saying, could potentially be the case. So um, I just want folks to, to you know, really look hard at their personal financial positions and ask themselves, you know, am, 
am I currently positioned defensively enough for this correction if it happens sooner than than I or most other people expect? Um, because we're seeing a preponderance of uh, consensus that uh, there is such a risk of a large correction and that its timing is not that far away. So, you know, we use the term picking up nickels in front of the steamrollers, you know, maybe in David's uh, parlance, uh, if, if there's 20% upside in the market, maybe you're picking up $10 bills or $20 bills in the front of the steamroller. But even then, is that risk worth the potential uh, cost of being wrong if you get caught uh, sooner than expected by a correction? Um, I think that that's a risk you don't want to be taking here, or at least it's a risk that you want to be buying insurance now, positioning prudently for, uh, to make sure that you don't become collateral damage to that risk. So um, uh, there's that point. And then the other point is that, um, you know, the future that David talks about is, um, you know, it's it's not a bright one. And the whole purpose of this channel here at Wealthion is to help people build wealth for the long term. So what we want to make sure you do is that a you don't lose the you know a majority of your wealth in a market correction of the type that we're talking about here. So capital preservation is 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 point number one, and then point number two is to try to help you get enough growth um, once the market conditions are favorable for growth, so that as we enter an era potentially as David's talking about where we have double digit inflation, we have double digit interest rates that um, you've got enough cushion um, and hopefully enough uh, sustainable growth in your portfolio that that's not just eating away into your principal over time. So, uh, uh, you know, guys, uh, David talked about the importance of active management going forward. He talked about the um, likelihood in his eyes that he sees the kind of, you know, natural resources spaces, commodity spaces, et cetera, as doing particularly well once we come out of the, uh, the de deflationary uh, market crunch here. Uh, so, John, let me just go to you here as we wrap things up. But, uh, you know, to me, that sounds like um, very consistent with where, where I think you guys think things will go after uh, a market correction like this. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, the role that you think a, a you know, professional active financial advisor can play in helping people navigate that, that, you know, kind of rougher error of high inflation and high interest rates. Um, let me stop talking here, but let me, let, let me give your answer here to, to, you know, how you see people uh, preserving and growing wealth best through and then after uh, this crunch. Yep. Well, now a um, couple, you know, regarding hedging and defensiveness, um, you know, there, there are mecha mechanistic uh, details that Mike and I and our team and our investment process are, are really attuned to. You know, we, we, we do it in our day jobs, right? That's not the hard part of, of becoming defensive. The hard part I would, I, would, I would propose is the psychological part. For folks that are not believing that this market will ever go down, um, that is your, you know, not, your biggest enemy is not understanding that the, the the, the mechanics of hedging. It's in believing that it's not important. Um, and that's all the more reason why I think, you know, if, if David Hunter's near-term melt-up scenario happens, rather than use that as, as evidence that this market is going higher and it will never go down, use that as the, you know, sinister siren song that is trying to get you to do the wrong thing. I because Because I think when you take a step back and look at the big cycles that Dave is talking about, the scenario he talks about is a very, very likely one. You know, a massive bust followed by, you know, a highly inflationary environment. You know, I'm going to ask you, Adam, maybe just to share a chart and we can provide you one of the long-term picture of 10-year U.S. Treasury bond yields. If you look at the last um, 40 years from 1980 to now, it's been nothing but down, Right. You couldn't imagine a more a perfect tailwind for a passive pie chart, set it and forget it investment program involving stocks and bonds. You could not design a better environment for that. Um, if you look at the lead up to 1980, 1960 to 1980, those 10 year treasury rates spiked higher. And that was a period that the stock market went nowhere pretty much and with far less leverage in the system. So you know, take a look at that chart and, and do, do the mental math of what it likely means for all the things we know as living adults today, what it means for investing. I mean, 401k plans really didn't even start to be a thing until the early 80s. So all of what we think we know about investing in markets 
we couldn't agree more with David, is going to likely be turned on its head. You know, it's going to be very important to be very active and defensive and tactical rather than, you know, the Wall Street mantra of time in the market is your friend. Don't don't try to time the market. We think that's all going to get turned on its head and, and in a very vicious way. So I would say working on one's psychology and understanding or appreciating that scenario is, is going to be the most important thing. All right. Very well said, John. And we're going to have to let that be the last point for this week. Um, guys, thanks so much for coming on again, sharing your insights here. For folks that are perhaps recent viewers um, and unfamiliar with this, um, you know, the main reason we do these videos is, again, to help people uh, get better informed so that they can make more prudent decisions about how to protect and grow their wealth. Um, we highly recommend, given the environment that we're heading into, that you work under the guidance of a professional financial advisor who understands all these risks that we've been talking about with David and then here with John and Mike. And John and Mike and their team specifically at New Harbor Financial, if it, look, if you've got a great financial advisor who understands all these risks and can factor them into the portfolio strategy they designed for you, perfect, stick with them. But if you don't, the guys here, uh, John and Mike and their team at New Harbor Financial, they offer free, no cost, no strings attached, no obligation to work with them, portfolio reviews, where they'll just sit down with you and they will review your personal financial situation. And then they'll tell you what they think you should do to be able to you know, protect yourself and position prudently in advance of what they see coming. Uh, they do that simply as a public service. They just want to help as many people as possible make smart decisions today to be able to protect and grow their wealth tomorrow. If you want to learn how to set up one of those free consultations with them, just stick around at the end of the video. It's coming up in just a second. Um, and please, if you want to see us continue to get more great guests like David on the show, please support this channel by simply hitting the like button and then clicking the subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Very simple, quick steps for you, but they actually do make a big difference in helping this channel get viewed by more and more people out there in the world. Um, if you wanna see who we're gonna be having on the program next as a guest expert or suggest who you'd like to see on the program, just follow me on Twitter at, at Menlo Bear. I listen to every suggestion uh, that folks make there. Uh, and then uh, uh, last, uh, as I say every week, we don't know exactly what's going to happen next, but whatever does happen, we will be tracking it here together. Me, the viewers, John and Mike and the team at New Harbor. Uh, so guys, I look forward to seeing you next week. And thanks so much for coming on the program today. Everybody else, thanks for watching. Thank you so thanks much, Adam. Adam. We'll see you, we'll next, see you week. next week. If you'd like to schedule a consultation with one of the financial advisors at New Harbor Financial, simply go to Wealthion.com. These consultations are completely free and there are no strings attached. The good folks at New Harbor will simply answer any questions you have about your investment goals or your portfolio and give you their best advice given their latest market outlook. They're willing to do this because they care about protecting people's wealth. And because Wealthion has connected them with so many thoughtful investors just like you over the past decade. We started doing this because so many people have approached us in frustration, looking for a solution because they're feeling out of alignment or downright ridiculed by the standard financial advisors who have been managing their money. You know the type. The kind that just pushes all of your money into the market, scoffs at the idea of owning gold, and when you bring up concerns about the market's sky-high valuations, they say, don't worry, the market will always take care of you. For many of the reasons discussed in today's video, we think this is one of the most challenging and treacherous times in history for investing. We strongly believe that today's investors are best served working in partnership with a conscientious professional financial advisor who understands the risks in play. Now, we're agnostic which professional advisor you work with, as long as they're good. If you're already working with one, that's fantastic. Stick with them. But if you don't, or are having trouble finding one you respect or trust, then consider talking to John and Mike and the team at New Harbor. Now, for those about to ask, yes, there's a business relationship between Wealthion and New Harbor, which we put in place to make sure everything is handled according to SEC regulations. All the details on this are clearly provided on the Wealthion.com website. Also, it's important to note that New Harbor is able to work with U.S. citizens, green card holders, and those with existing assets in the USA. But for regulatory reasons, they aren't able to take on non-U.S. clients. All right. With all that said, if you'd like some insight and guidance on how to protect your wealth during this unprecedented time in the markets, go to Wealthion.com. 
to schedule your free consultation with the good folks at New Harbor. Thanks for watching. Thank you.